I think that was the last of the Grim for now. <sighs> hey everybody, welcome back to Ruby Feedback, where I take comments that you guys left on the last Ruby episodic review, and well, I give my feedback on them. And since there's a lapse in the Grim attack for now, Let's get to it. I don't think Vale is beating this breach back this time. We've got three episodes of Chaos left where a whole lot of stuff can happen. But I think that in the end, the people and Huntsman are going to be forced to flee from Vale entirely and retreat to Atlas. I also don't think we will be able to take Amber with them, nor that Pyrrha will take her aura before the retreat happens. At the end of this volume, I think Cinder's gonna be co going to be a full-blown maiden. Well, I think the concept of them totally abandoning Vale is definitely possible, but they would only do it if it was the only thing that can be done. I mean, they have an entire military there. So the fact that they might lose the entire city it's kind of far-fetched, but it can definitely be achieved with the amount of planning that was put into this Master Chaos Syndicate plan. And I do believe that they may try to move Amber, but with everything that's going to go down at Beacon with the White Fang and Grim going to be there and possibly Cinder and company arriving later, I don't think they're going to be able to evacuate her from the vault. I believe a fight between Cinder, Mercury, Emerald and Ozpin will happen soon. It seemed Crow was worried about Amber being left alone, and Ozpin put the people's safety before his own. I get the feeling, and don't kill me on this one, for this, that Ozpin might die in the battle between Cinder, Mercury, and Emerald, and the end of the season will have Cinder at her full maiden power. I don't think, I really don't see Pyrrha in any condition to wield such power yet. Or if somehow Pyrrha does get the power, Cinder will have to eliminate a huge threat, a headmaster of one of the four schools, and that might be a victory in her eyes. Well, as I was saying back in the review, that Ozpin is pretty much at the uh, at Beacon by himself. I mean, there's probably a few other people there, and we know that Yang and Zwei are there, but he's really the big stone brick wall standing in the Chaos Syndicate's way to get to Amber. And the idea of them three taking him down, it would have to be a victory for them at a high cost. Because you saw how banged up they were even after fighting Amber. And she had seasonal maiden powers. But Ozpin? We have no idea how skilled and powerful he is. He could be like freaking... President King Bradley from uh, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood moves so fast that he can slice you apart and you don't even know he, you, he took his sword out. The sword hides in his cane. But I do think that the odds of Ozpin dying are pretty high or the odds of him being beaten and put into a seriously wounded state is also very high. Unless some other huntsmen get there fast He's, he, his odds aren't stacked in his favor. Am I the only one thinking Cinder has a fair point? She is questioning the system in place. Ironwood's questionable moral uh, partaking, Ozpin's stubborn ways, and basically saying everyone starts thinking critically about everything around you. Uh, don't blindly follow people. Think for yourselves. Well, that kind of goes against how she operates with Emerald and Mercury, how she wants them to not think but obey. So does this mean that Cinder is a bit of a hypocrite? The way she was going about it, it is all about shock value, getting people's attention. She is putting citizens in a tough spot where they have no choice but to think and not trusting everything. I dislike the way she's going about it, but there is a point. That is true. Even though she's the villain of the story and all that, the way she presented her speech and what she talked about brought up fair points. 
That's what I was talking about. How there was an energy to it. An energy that almost made you want to believe in what she was saying. Cinder definitely has a point, but I think that her reasoning for doing it is sort of wrong. But she has valid points, yes. Why didn't Ruby just turn around and go back the way she entered? Silly master of all stuff, then Penny wouldn't have died. Still no Yang and Ruby's dad. Can't spell his name. Uh, his name is Tai Yang, and it isn't as difficult to spell as you may think. But I think that he may come in at the very end of the volume. Ruby seems to have the knack for introducing new characters at the end of volumes. Well, with volume two, they kind of introduced, they reintroduced Adam but he was only in a trailer, not so much the series. And in volume one, they introduced the Chaos Syndicate, so maybe with volume three, they'll bring in Tai Yang and maybe a few other people. I realized it was never mentioned that Grimm attacked the Faunus. Even in the World of Remnant episode about Grimm, the only thing that was said is that the Grimm exclusively attack humans and their creations. Now, uh, maybe that might help explain a bit how the White Fang was able to take Grimm to Beacon in the Bullheads. I know they need a lot more than just that to start transporting Grimm around the world, but it might be a start to explain how they were able to do it. Perhaps Cinder and her superior, or superiors, who knows, reveal slash gave to the White Fang some way to control the Grimm. Now, it is true that it didn't say, oh, they attack Faunus too. But I think Faunus and humans are kind of put in the same category because Faunus still technically are human. They just have animal a attributes. And if they, if Grimm didn't attack Faunus, then why wasn't that brought up specifically? That is a big detail to just leave out of the lore of a world. Plus, why would a Faunus Huntsman be put into peril if the Grimm didn't attack them? But here's something else to think about. It states that it uh, the Grimm attack humans and their creations. Technically, the bullheads were created by humans. So why aren't those bullheads destroyed? Actually, I calculated the size of the cafeteria and the time it took Ruby to get from one side uh, to the other multiple times in different ways, like using the height of Jean compared to the window or Pira to the tables. The fastest Ruby went, according to science, was 0.60624 kilometers per hour, which is pathetic. That is really pathetic. So physics really don't exist in Ruby. Yeah. With s science? If you did the science, then yes. But like in the show, obviously she did this amazing feat. But dang, you're using physics and science against me! Dang it, why can't Ruby just make sense? Last time we saw Zwei is when the first episode of the volume. He was with Ruby and Yang's dad. Technically, he's also Ruby's dad, but whatever. So that means Tai Yang sent Zwei in the mail again, dropped him off or to keep you in company after hearing what happened, or he's there. Ugh, I really hope he's there. There's gonna, there's gonna be more fighters. Also, I really want to see Adam and Blake see each other in the next episode. Fingers crossed. Now, uh... Yes, since Zwei is indeed at Beacon, that means that he either arrived there during some time in the past few episodes, or that means Tai Yang is now there as well. Because uh, back in Volume 2, Tai Yang sent Zwei to his girls because he was going off um, away and they needed to take care of the dog. But uh, it could be possible that Zwei was always at the dorm room throughout this volume, we just didn't see him because, you know, Tai Yang was going off on some missions. That's what Ruby was uh, telling Summer Rose at her grave that uh, dad is finally going on some missions. So he was probably giving uh, custody of Zwei back to Ruby and Yang. So the odds are that Zwei was always there, but we just didn't see him. I mean, think about it. Ironwood came into their dorm room. Do you think he would approve of a dog being in there? Well, maybe, but maybe not. So maybe they hit him 
you know, maybe they hit him, like in a drawer or something. When Sun spotted the Nevermore, Ren and Coco were sitting next to him, but at the start of the fight, Nora was sitting left to Ren. What? Valid. Valid answer. May well, you know, maybe like Ren was running to them, but maybe he was a couple seats away. Either way, it made for a cool shot. Pura got her victory, and all it costed her was a penny. Cue the stock laughter! <laughs> I actually think Penny is dead, and the thing with her eyes was her aura leaving her body. You have a valid point that that may be what was happening, but if you think of it this way, the military put in probably millions, or maybe even billions of Lien into the creation of Penny. Plus, she was pretty much the prototype because they, that, that was pretty much the next step in a robot synthetic army was taking souls and then putting them into robots. Now, you see, what would be the point of even doing that if there, once that robot was destroyed, you couldn't re-harvest the, the soul that was inside of it and either repair the robot or put that soul into a new robot. It just seems not very cost effective. What would be the point of creating a synthetic army that pretty much is the same as humans? Once they die, they're permanently dead. Why would you even bother making a synthetic army when using a human army is much more productive and less against moral ethics? Anyway, what I'm trying to say is they probably built Penny so that she could take damage and be repaired from it. Jake, she knew she was a robot. There were wires and sparks and everything. True, but in the very first seconds of Pyrrha ev eviscerating Penny, I mean, she probably wasn't looking for sparks or wires. She just saw this girl fall into pieces. That would send anyone into shock and be all like, oh my God, I killed someone. And then, you know, later on, as she was looking, she was probably like, well, wait a minute, let me know blood is coming out. I mean, maybe that's hydraulic fluid, oil, sparks. Wait a minute, something ain't right here. The thing is, Pyrrha eventually figured out that she was a robot. But that initial few seconds after the evisceration, she didn't. She didn't know Penny was a robot. Ospin is gonna get Dumbledore'd. You may say that, yes, but who is Snape? And no, it cannot be Cinder. Cinder is not cool enough to be Snape. What if, as a side goal, the White Fang might try to find Blake? I mean, Adam's there, and according to the Black trailer, B Blake didn't give Adam any warning when she ran off. If they bump into each other, I bet Adam is going to be demanding some answers from Blake. Just some of my thoughts. Well, yeah, obviously he's gonna want answers, but... Uh, her, them finding Blake in all this madness is probably, like, the possibility of that happening is very, very low, according to the White Fang. I mean, obviously, Blake is going to be there probably trying to fight them off, or at least stop them from doing what they're doing. And it might come to the point where it's Adam and Blake, Blake's trying to stop him from doing whatever, and then they eventually have to fight each other, that's what I'm thinking. Jake, I'm sorry if this is personal. However, did you cry when Penny died? If so, you're not alone. Me and one of my friends who watched Ruby did too. Well, you may call me a heartless bastard, but I didn't cry at all. You see, I kind of expected something to happen. I wasn't expecting the brutality of it. That was definitely a shock to me. And you know, I kind of just sat there like slack jawed, eyes wide, just like, oh my gosh, that actually happened. But I didn't cry because like once it really happened, I mean, all of a sudden all this other stuff was starting to happen. And, you know, with the whole speech and everything, and, you know, I was already thinking that, like, well, yeah, she's been eviscerated, but she's a robot, so she, is she really truly dead? So you may call me a heartless bastard for it, but that's kind of how it went down for me. I'm curious, are you dyslexic? Uh, probably. I mean, haven't been diagnosed, but I think there's probably a good possibility that I am. Or I'm just terrible at spelling. To be honest, I don't think Penny is dead. 
I mean, the entire Ruby fan base is treating her destruction like she suffered the same kind of fate as Android 16 in Dragon Ball Z. In my opinion, she will be rebuilt and her memories might be slightly altered, but she will be the same be the same penny. I agree with that as well. I mean, a few comments have stated that like, well, magnets can totally like mess up computers, so Penny could actually truly be dead. That is true, but you see, when the pulse hit Penny, she was still active. She was still functioning. She was still like, you know, cognitive and alert. It wasn't until she took the massive damage that she powered down and went into her standby state. And as for everybody who's treating this as like the as Penny's death as Android 16's death, think of it this way. Is Penny's has Penny's head been crushed? No. Android 16's head was crushed and he was truly dead. Penny is just in a couple pieces. I'm pretty sure they can they can fix her. I wonder what would happen if the following happened. Weiss leaves to live in Atlas to live with her family. Blake leaves to potentially join the White Fang. Yang leaves with Crow to track down Raven. And Ruby leaves to live with Tai Yang and Zwei. Well then, we would have a volume where Team Ruby is separated. That could actually be a really cool idea. We would get to see how they function without each other, introduce new characters, and then they would able to grow as characters separately and figure out that they truly need each other. That might, that might be a really good idea to separate them for a while. Isn't this when the train from volume two was supposed to arrive? I think so, yes. I think that was part of the initial plan, that once everything starts to go haywire, once all this starts to happen, then the train goes, creates, creates all those breaches, and then gives the Grim a tunnel to enter the city without having to go over or through its walls. But you see, um, Team Ruby came into the mix, the train went early, and so Cinder had to make the best out of that scenario. And she even used it to her advantage. She was like, well, Ozpin, you know, made his fighter do this to the other fighter so that she would win the tournament and then people would forget his failure at the breach. She made this situation to her advantage, but the train was definitely part of the original plan. So Torchwick being captured probably wasn't. Just a random thought that occurred to me. Why was Roman's hat taken? I get why his cane was taken. I say his cane because I can't technically say those words correctly. It was his weapon. But would there be any special thing about his hat? I mean, it's a hat. Well, you see, you don't understand. Hats grant the wearer's power. And if you take the hat, you disrupted the man. To quote Frieza from Dragon Ball Z Abridged, I'm sorry, but if this shit goes any further south, we're going to hit Space Mexico. I don't know if someone pointed this out, but maybe Adam can control Grimm with his semblance, or perhaps beasts in general. Uh, you see, the concept of him controlling Grimm? Obviously it's possible, because we don't know where semblances can end in their power or where they even begin with their power. But the concept of him controlling the Grimm just by his own power seems a bit just out of the blue because it's like all of a sudden it's like, oh, Adam can control Grimm. It's like, why wouldn't he use that more in his fight against humanity? Jake, what are you going to do when Ruby is over? What will your videos hold for us? Well, do you mean when the Ruby volume is over or when the Ruby as a series is forever over? In the concept of just the uh, volume being over, I still uh, talk about Ruby in the off season. I talk about fan theories. I talk about developments that were made at the end of the volume. I talk about songs, break those down. Uh, I can come up with something to talk about in the off season. But if you mean the end of Ruby as a series forever, as a whole, well, hopefully by that time, I'll have come up with some other thing that can occupy my time as much as Ruby does, and 
start doing reviews on that or what have you. I got lots of plans, it's just Ruby right now is what's consuming my life. I also have to say, I absolutely love how Roman and Neo killed all those people. I'm bummed about Penny, but Roman made me feel better. Well, you know what they say, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Or, you know, something like that. Jake, if you could come up with your own species of Grimm, what animal would it be and what would you call it? Ooh, good question. Maybe something that should be saved for another video, but I'm thinking a platypus. Because platypus. Trust me, Jake, that very much was Penny's final match. And yes, I do understand that at that moment in the video, I did miss the opportunity for a very good joke, but I was too busy trying to get the, the, uh, the review a rolling. What if? We have the other three maidens appear in the midst of the battle. Well, I think that may be the only thing that would be able to save Vale from this calamity that's about to happen to it, is if the rest of the seasonal maidens arrive to help quell the invasion. But then the mystery of who they are is kind of gone, and that might be a good thing or maybe a bad thing, but it seems like it would just be pulling a happy ending just out of the butt of the plot. I think this volume needs to end on like a somber note. This this volume needs to be like the Empire Strikes Back of um, Ruby right now because the last two volumes, they've ended pretty well. They ended with them catching the bad guys and stopping the evil deeds. This one needs to end just with with not so much good, but there's still a ray of hope at the end of the tunnel. There's a lot of dark, but there's still a few lights holding strong in the shadow. That's what we need. That's what this volume needs to end with. Please read, Jake. First and foremost, uh, Rooster Teeth, stop messing with Yang and Ruby. What did Sunset ever do to you? What Sunset? Is that a shipping name? I thought Yang and Ruby were was Team Enabler. But anyway, the reason why they're messing with Yang and Ruby is because they're the main characters. And you mess with your main characters in a story. That's what makes us care about them. Now that that's out of the way, we can get to why it's time to get down to business. Cinder has done what few villains have ever done. She has won. Even if she was to die, her plans to destroy the trust between the people, the military, the kingdoms, and the huntsmen will be solidified now. Also, I feel like Ironwood was scared of Ozpin's anger. For that last part of the comment, yes, I think Ironwood was a little taken back by Ozpin's, you know, just anger. Because of what we've seen so far, Ozpin has, like, never raised his voice. He's always remained calm, even in the most dire and most tense of situations. But now he he's kind of losing his composure. So th that would put anyone on edge. And yeah, the middle part of this comment, Cinder has indeed won. The seeds indeed have been planted, and even though they may not take at first, the, that, that weed is eventually going to grow and split the trust between all these factions of people. The Grim being transported only supports the Cinder is a Grim theory. Now, yes, this would be a solid piece of evidence, but you see, Cinder isn't with the White Fang right there. I mean, I don't know if Cinder is a Grim, how far her power of control would be. Like, can she control Grim that are a kilometer away? that are five miles away or that are only 25 feet away. There, there's a lot to think about here. I mean, yes, obviously the aspect of her being able to c control Grimm would definitely solve this issue and this question, but the fact still remains that there's a distance issue. How much of a distance does she need? So the concept of Cinder being a Grimm supported by the fact that they were able to transport Grimm, I'm gonna put that in the save for later category. Why would the White Fang attack the academies? Do they know there are Faunus in there? Well, 
the concept of the White Fang, I think, is kind of like the Brotherhood of Mutants from X-Men. Sort of like, it, for, to other humans, you're either with us or you're kind of against us. So, you're either going to help us or you're going to stay out of our way. And the faunus that are at the Academy are going to be Huntsmen. So, the Huntsmen are obviously going to try to stop the White Fang because they're a terrorist group. And, you know, there's obviously going to be some infighting, but the reason why the White Fang is, is attacking the Academies is because they want to get to the source of the problem. The people who are running the, the, the kingdoms, you know. Or they were ordered by Cinder that you will attack the Academy or else I will kill you. Something like that. It will be okay, guys. This is the point of the story where the shopkeeper reveals his true powers and saves the world. I totally go for that. That should totally be a thing. Me after seeing Volume 3 opening. Something dark better happen in this season. Me now. I changed my mind! Bring back the light! <laughs> there is no going back! <laughs> I believe that the Grimm are being dropped off at the stadium instead of the school. Why is that? I mean, the where they were being dropped off seemed like the landing pad that uh, the Academy has. But then again, I may be wrong. I may have been overstepping my boundaries. I guess we'll find out in the next episode. Uh, this is Cinder's big chance to get Amber and... Crow argues with Ozpin, but is quickly shot down and told to defend the city. Y yes, that last part did happen. Was is that a question or a comment or or what? But I do agree with the concept that Cinder is going for Amber, and she probably knows that Amber is at Beacon Academy, but doesn't know where exactly. So there's probably going to probably be maybe some questioning, you know, Cinder probably trying to get the answer out of Ozpin. Last note, Cinder's speech felt like something out of a Metal Gear Solid game. It did, but you see, it didn't last for a half hour, so it couldn't have been in a Metal Gear Solid game. You see, I make that joke, but I actually really like Metal Gear Solid games. Jake, I know the Grim are attracted to negative emotions, but could it be possible for someone to have enough hatred, rage, and anger inside them to control the Grim like an alpha male or like Adam or alpha female like Cinder? So you're suggesting that they would form a symbiotic relationship where the Grim would feed off of their negative emotion but follow their command? It, it may make sense, yes, but of what we've seen, we know that the Grimm do feed off a negative emotion, but they always need to, to maul and to kill. That's their one drive. So even though they come across someone who has all this negative emotion built up inside them, I think that they would still be hardwired to mangle and kill that person. But it's definitely an interesting concept, something that we should look out for. I know Cinder wants Amber, but what's the plan after that? We know that Cinder reports to someone even higher than she. Uh, what is the plan now? What exactly is Cinder trying to accomplish by driving a wedge between the kingdoms? Uh, this episode was a roller coaster of emotions. Well, you see, with the wedge put between the kingdoms, the kingdoms will start to fracture, and they won't be an alliance anymore. They'll start to look at each other with suspicion, and therefore, once again, quite possibly, war between kingdoms will break out. And once war between kingdoms breaks out, whatever malevol malevolent force that Cinder works for will be able to take bigger strides in trying to take over the world, destroy the world. Once the kingdoms are divided, they won't be as strong as they were united, obviously. So, I think not so much, like, this plan that is happening right now isn't so much as, oh, get the Seasonal Maiden's power. That isn't the main drive. The main drive is to drive a wedge between the kingdoms. Getting the rest of the Seasonal Maiden's power 
is sort of like a bonus. Once they get that, then Cinder will be mega powerful, and then she can do pretty much whatever she wants. Please tell me I wasn't the only one who noticed one of Junior's men in the audience at one point. No, I noticed that. I just didn't really, didn't really make a note of it because I don't think it was that important. I just think they needed extras in the audience, so they just kind of put extras in the audience. I mean, the production team has to cut corners at least in some places. Hey Jig, just wanted to put this out there. Knowing Penny is based off of Pinocchio, do you think that her aura might be put into Amber? I say this because when Pinocchio was thought to be dead, he was turned into a real boy. That would definitely be achieving the inspirational finale of Pinocchio, taking Penny's remains, taking what's left of her aura and transferring it into Amber's body. Therefore, it would kind of make a since Penny probably has her full soul, or at least a fraction of it, and since Amber has at least half of it, putting it together would make one, and she would be alive again. So, Penny would get a real body, she'd be a real girl, but she would still be a, a, a weapon with, you know, half a seasonal maiden's powers. That, that, this might overcomplicate things, but, you know, Penny would be alive, and Amber would be alive, and they'd both be real girls, so... I guess it would be a win-win... win sort of win? But I think this is a cool idea! We can rebuild her! We have technology! It didn't work. Please put my comment in your feedback video, please. No. I refuse. Dang. Jake better get his OC's spinning blade weapons. Well, you see, I can't really get those. Josh is already out there fighting Grimm. I can't just take those from him. Does this mean we finally get to see Velvet's weapon? One can only dream. But it better happen. Or else, you know, people, people are gonna die and disappear. Alrighty, you guys, this is going to end this Ruby feedback video. I hope that you enjoyed. I know that there was a lot, a lot of comments on this video, and so many of them were good and talking along the same lines, you know, pretty much stating the same things. So once again, that's why I have to choose specific ones get them, talk about them, all that kind of stuff. But to everyone who commented, you're all awesome, and I love every single one of your comments. But until next time, be sure to like and favorite if you've enjoyed, subscribe of course if you feel inclined to. Uh, check out Team Theory over there on Facebook, you can put Crackpot Theories there. Check out my Patreon page if you wish to support me on Patreon. Once again, big thanks to all my Patreon supporters, especially Duncan Ishler and Grant Allen Hill. You guys are awesome, and be sure to subscribe if you feel inclined to, and uh, check out some other videos that I've done. I mean, I mean, if you have time. I think another grim wave is coming, so I gotta get back out there. You guys should get back out there too. I'll see you next time. I'm out there in YouTube land, and hopefully... Hopefully we can quell this infestation.